Hey, Elisa. Thanks for joining us today. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. Look, um, what we love to know um, about our guests who join us on this podcast is where did it all begin for you in the sector? Where did your journey start? Can you share that with us? Yeah, sure. So I started in early childhood when I was 16. Um, so I did year 12 and worked in a centre at the same time. Um, I've been with the same organisation for 20 years now. Um, so all of my early childhood journey has been with that same organisation. Um, so I started as an assistant, then became a room leader, then became a 2IC and then became a director, um, which I was in a position for 12 years. Um, and then I had a long service leave break and now I'm doing the media and marketing for that organisation. So I left oh, wow. that and just doing it as a whole for the whole company. That's fantastic. Now, what a, um, a lovely story to know that you're at the same um, provider and they obviously are doing something really well. Yes, we get a lot of autonomy, um, which is always so important in management, um, being able to make decisions for the service that you were running. Um, so I think that made it a lot easier to be in the same place for so long. So now some of our listeners, actually a lot of our listeners are educators, room leaders, 2YCs, centre managers. So to have someone here and talking with us about that, um, about their journey and their experience is really important because um, there's highs and lows through every role, right? There's lots That's of right. things that go on. There's lots of busy lives. And with a service, um, as we discussed, our topic is about getting to high occupancy um, and focusing on the program. Uh, that, that's something you've obviously had a lot of experience with, but not only from being part of that project, that process, but also watching it from an assistant and, a, and, then, and then right through that journey. Why is it so important about focusing on the program? So I've, I've always said that you need to live your philosophy. Um, you need everyone to buy into your philosophy. Um, and so obviously the basis of the philosophy is the program um, and making sure it's a fantastic place for children, a fantastic place for families, but also for the staff um, to make sure that they are enjoying themselves. Um, and therefore, if they're outlaying happiness, then everybody will be happy um, and therefore more families will buy into your program. And and when you're talking about program and how how do you find, so if, as a centre manager, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, what would be something you would say to a centre manager that's listening that's not sure how to get the buy-in from their team because obviously that's where it's going to start to before you can sort of push it out further. What's sort of one thing that you would say, this is really crucial, this is what worked for me? So I would say to do your research. Um, so that was something that I did very, that I did a lot at the beginning. Um, I thought about things I wanted to bring into the service, but I needed to have the um, theory behind it. I needed to have the knowledge behind it to share with everyone. Um, so it wasn't just let's do this and then nobody knew why. Um, yes. For example, we had a free art philosophy, so we always focused on process-based art and not end product art. And a lot of people really don't understand that concept at the beginning. So if I didn't have the knowledge to share with them, then they wouldn't be able to understand why. And it just comes back to being able to explain why we do what we do. So you can explain it to families, you can explain it to children, you can explain it to other staff, students, so then they can take it out into the sector, into other places as well. Yeah, and I su and I suppose what you're talking about there is also when you're at you know when you're providing that feedback, research, data, evidence as to why you think this is a good idea for your service or um, to do this or your organisation to do this. When you're doing that, you're getting the buy-in from from people, right? You're That's getting right. that. We we want to be on your journey. What do you do if there's someone who doesn't want to be on the journey? What's <laughs> what's your tip? So that does come up. Um, it definitely comes up a lot. So I'm not saying it's an easy process, um, but I just feel you need to really break it down to the simple basics and explain it in that way. Um, and also if you have a lot of um, other leaders who are also educating themselves, then they can do it at um, a lower level. So I'm doing it at the management level and then you'll have the room leaders doing it in the room level um, and even just um, uh, 
you've got your multi-age educators, floaters and things. If they're all buying in, they're moving from room to room and sharing that same knowledge and wisdom. Um, and you've just got to have a lot of meetings. So at the very beginning, we had a lot of team meetings where it was just like, let's just talk about it. What are the issues? What's everyone stressed about? And generally people were feeling the same way that, um, you know, it might impact supervision, certain things, or it might um, upset the families, which is generally one of the biggest concerns people yeah, have. Absolutely. Um, and it's just teaching them the skills to navigate that. If a family does have an issue with this reason, then we can explain that we do this, 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 um, so that they know how to handle that situation. So, so, and really what I'm hearing from you is it's about improvement, quality yeah. improvement, but also consistency in your practice. Definitely. So that everyone's on the same page. Yes. And if, you know, you've got three rooms out of five that are doing it one way and two that are doing it another, there's such a disconnect. Um, and families will have children in multiple rooms. So they yeah. be like, why are you guys doing this? And then they are doing that. So you've got to make sure it's a whole service buy-in. Yeah. And quite often we forget, I mean, I, I'm certainly guilty of it, that families are more than one child. They That's actually right. could have multiple children. Do you find that as well, that sometimes we forget that there's families of more than one child? Yes, absolutely. And yeah. um, a lot of these things are very focused on preschool um, or the kindergarten age groups. So you, if you, um, for example, we had um, multi-age grouping so all the children could play together and we're like, everybody thinks, you know, kinders will be able to handle it. That's fine. And then you forget about the babies that these same families who are okay with their children that are older doing things you need to make sure they're okay with their little children doing things yeah and as a center manager and I know you're not in that role anymore but 12 years as a center manager gives you great kudos to to understand the journey of a center manager and, and the day in the life of, <laughs> of, any, of a center manager <laughs> what um having you know having that consistent practice or and and across your rooms regardless with the staff or um, families however it is how important is it for you to be able to manage that consistency rather than having that too what impact does it make on you so it, it can be tough um, because you've got to, depending on the size of your service. So I had a 120 place service. So it would be 30 to 35 educators at a time once it was full. Um, so making sure that you are having those connections with all the staff so that you can um, explain everything to them um, and also having the um, meetings so you were doing that regularly um, on top of your everyday workload so you've already got so much to do um, I'm a very organized person um, so I find it quite easily easy to multitask but I can understand that a lot of people would be like I don't have time to implement all these extra programs on top of the basics um, because it's a lot so if I didn't have the team that I had I've worked with an incredible 2IC, incredible educational leaders, kindergarten teachers and all of the educators that have supported me throughout my time. So if I didn't have that um, and I was just trying to navigate it on my own, um, I don't think we would have been as successful as we were. Yeah. And, and so what I hear from that, uh, Eliza, uh, okay, Eliza. 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 <laughs> Eliza. <laughs> is the, um, is the, What's important is not actually being that dictator as such, but actually getting the support of your team. If you've got 35 staff, sharing the load. That's Would right. that be yeah. fair to say? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Fantastic. Now, um, and I know we're talking about occupancy. So to link that to occupancy, how – I'm a pre provider listening, I'm, a, I'm a, um, an owner listening. They're going, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's not related to my occupancy. How do you link that to your occupancy? So um, when I took over as director, um, we only had 16 families. Um, the centre was going through a really rough patch. Um, and once I left, it was at like 200 families at a time. Wow. Um, so, so proven success. I, I, I have lived this journey, yes. <laughs> um, so it was very um, quiet. Um, there'd been a lot of centres in the area, a lot of change. So um, a lot of people had left. And so we were practically starting again. Um, and it just, it took it took time. I'm, I'm not saying that we went from zero to 100% in a year. It took a long time, um, but it was just about finding um, educators that bought into the philosophy, 
that lived it and explained it and um, got the families on board. The children were really enjoying themselves and we were always trying to find ways to make it that everybody was happy, like stress-free. That was always my thing. We don't want to be stressed. We shouldn't be in childcare stressed about things that we can fix. Um, for example, we had a fence that went between two yards. So one was zero to three and one was three to five. And the little children would just stand at the fence and cry for their siblings for ages every morning because it was just an, an emotional transition. So then um, of all people, our cook was the one that was like, why don't we just open the gate and let them play there? Like, why are we stopping this from happening? So we were like, okay, we discussed it, open the gate. And then that transition went away. They just would come outside, go straight over to play with their siblings and everything calmed down. Um, and it just made it so happy for everyone. And then by that, the families are happy. And then they go and they tell their friends, they go to mother's group. It gets out into the area and it didn't take too long for the word of mouth to start snowballing. And all of a sudden you would, I remember there was a time, it might've been 2013, 14, so maybe three or four years in where I was doing seven tours a day. Like it just was people just walking off the street. Wow. Yeah. Um, because they had heard about it and they wanted to come in and have a look and see what was going on. Wow. And obviously your skills at a tour must have been very good. Because... Yeah, I, I felt like I had I had rehearsed my little spiel that you say a lot. I yeah. said it a lot by then. So yeah. I, was I, there any um sorry. any other tips you can give about about those tours that you know, like you said, you re re you had your rehearsed your script, you knew what you had to say. Was there anything else you did before a tour or before? Because that's seven a day. That's huge. Yes, and and as I said, that they were unexpected ones. They weren't booking them in they were just coming in so we weren't even prepared that they were like already having that discussion with them um so I I um, always make sure that when I would follow up I would send them an email with documentation that included our philosophy um and it was um the philosophy then a breakdown of our values and then also things you would see at our service and things you wouldn't see at our service so for example you would say we well, you will see the children will go outside and play in all types of weather so if it's raining they'll go out with raincoats on and gum boots so that they knew that that was going to happen or on the other set hand you you won't see a child um being forced to make the same sheep that every other child's making because we believe in a process-based art philosophy so they won't come home with cookie cutter crafts they will be coming home with unique art items um, and I think that that really helped because they could go home and read that and decide that is for me I do like all of these things or maybe that's not so much for me and then um, I've always been an advocate for you need to find the center that's right for you so that's why I give them that option to go home and read that information Wow, that's actually so impressive because I know, <clears throat> I know, you know, occupancy is so talked about at the moment. It's such a big deal, and having that conversion from your lead to a family is on on the centre manager's shoulders, really. Um, and you're you're in charge of that. <clears throat> so offering some advice and support to centre managers maybe struggling with that whole sales process I suppose um, to just give those basic tips is is fantastic and and through that you actually talked about um, the cookie cutter the the um, uh, unique craft experience what what showing the parents the, what actually what the children will do yes and not actually about what the center is going to do for the parent but actually about what the center is going to do for the children That's right. and I know um, when we were talking before um, one of your recommendations is to focus on kids having a great time That's as right. part of the execution um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that now we're there with with the uh, you know the cookie cutter and the non-cookie cutter approach. Yes, sure. Um, so that's always been my ethos, I guess, is that I want them to have um, a great time. I want them to have an authentic childhood like we all had where you get to play in mud and you get to go outside in the rain. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought I would end up doing that. Um, so, I thought um, it was on silent. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I want them to have an authentic childhood like we all had. So um, one of the um, – we did a professional development um, in 
my early time as a director, uh, which was very inspiring um, by Journey into Play. I don't think they do it anymore. Um, but they really peeled it back and were like, let's talk about what you loved to do as a child. So we all said things that we loved when we were young. And then um, we were like, how can we incorporate that into our service? How can we be let them have heaps of outside time? Um, and how can we let them get really messy? Um, so that's where that all came from, our own childhood memories of things we enjoyed. Um, and then we started working on um, not trying not to say no to everything. Why, why does everything have to be a no? So it's like, can we go and paint outside? Yes, we can. We might not be able to go and paint a fence, but we could take the easels outside and you could paint out there. Um, or why can't I go into the three-year-old yard? And we're like, well, there isn't a reason why you can't. So why don't we just let them? <laughs> um, and we started to find out that all of those things just made it so much calmer for everybody because the children were enjoying themselves and the staff weren't just going, no, no, stop, get away from that, come back inside, because that's what you just felt like your day was surrounded by, the the stopping of their creativity, I guess, and their yeah. own ideas yeah. um, and yeah. taking it back to their own agency, letting the children lead their own play and dictate what they want to do. Um, and a lot of people think that that means that they just run riot and they can just do whatever they want. But it's more about, you know, they have boundaries, um, but it's just letting the boundaries be bigger than the small boundaries they had when they we first started out. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, what you're what you're saying, what I'm hearing is, you've removed barriers that were not necessary. That's right. That's and and so it's about a, looking at what's an unnecessary barrier, and giving the children the ability to have boundaries, but but ones that are fluid or ones that are actually without saying a hundred no's in a day. That's right. And you know, we would discuss what are the high stress times and it would be um you know family grouping until 8 a.m where all the age groups are together in one room or um rainy days where the room would have to be inside for an entire day and it's like okay so if we just have an indoor outdoor program and they can just go outside whenever they want the quieter <laughs> ones can kind of retreat in the boisterous ones can go outside and run as long as they're dressed, as long as they are appropriately dressed, then we don't have any issues here. And then all of a sudden the noise level would go down, the staff would calm down and it was just easy. And then it would, you would know within a minute every morning, okay, we need to start the program, open the door because it's starting to get just that tiny little bit easy. <laughs> And we're starting the to get worked going up. up. We, don't, we don't need to get worked up. We can just open the door and then they will just go outside. Yeah, and, and look, and I, I hear you. I mean, children are not the same, right? You know, some kids want to play out in the rain. Some kids don't want to play out in the rain. Yeah, some kids want I, the opportunity just, to try it. That's right. I, I think about when you were young, um, some people had a, a real um, outdoor growing up in nature kind of experience, and then there's others that never had that. Um, so we're giving them that opportunity to go out there and explore weather when uh, sometimes they might just be inside for the majority of the time. So, so, so you've now got happier staff, happier kids, because you focus on the kids and looking at those barriers, yep. working with the staff to make better decisions on what to offer the children and how to work it together, yep. which then leads to happier parents. That's right. And your happier parents, your word of mouth, your occupancy. That's right. Wow. And, and like I said, you've, you've done this and you've proven this um, with your success at, at your service, which is amazing. Um, is there anything else? Are there any other roadblocks to the journey um, that you can, you know, you, you may have seen and experienced that you'd like to share with, with our audience? Yeah, so I just think that um, I, a lot of people, and I had that myself with staff, um, will say, oh, we can't do that because the regulations say we can't. Or all oh, the department will tell us off if we come in and they see that we're doing this. Um, for example, we had a campfire in our backyard one time for NAIDOC week. And, you know, people were like, but the department will tell us off if they see this. Um, and it's, I so, you know, I, I always explain to people, you need to go and learn 
the regulations. You need to go and read them. You need to start to really read the national quality standard and learn it um, because it. a lot of those things are just hearsay. They just come up in the early childhood space somewhere. I don't know. Um, and then people think okay, it's gospel, so therefore we can't do that. And it's not true at all. Um, so something I would have always said to my staff is, it's not, that's, there's nothing that specific in the regulations. They are like the most basic statements. Um, so that's a, just an advice that I would give to new directors or staff who aren't so sure about the regulations, just to go through and just have a read of them and realize they are very broad statements that you can work things in that you might not have thought were okay. Yeah, like I know a lot of people would go, you couldn't have a fire in a childcare center, but if it's controlled, it has a risk assessment, um, all the staff are aware of what's happening, the children have been educated on safety, then it's completely fine. Yeah, and, and also what a great way to learn about something that's every day for most adults is, yeah. you know, fire. That's so right. That fire yes. safety, fire. I mean, even in our houses, we have smoke detectors, we have ways you need to reduce the risk of fire you go camping with kids they go you know there's so many ways to experience fire as a as an adult it's such a great example actually yes. and because I realize, would think, how did you do it that's right and you don't realize that a lot of the children were very educated on this they were like oh when we go camping we have a fire and we know that we're not allowed to stand too close or and they already have that knowledge but then you might have you know, a quarter of the group that have never experienced that. So therefore that's such a learning opportunity for them. Yeah. And what a, what a great week to do it in NADOC week, you yes. know, where it's that, that culture, that community, um, part of all that, you know, back to country and things like that. So no, well done to you. Um, is there anything else, any other roadblocks that you can think of? Or um, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm picking your brain here because That's I know, you, you, uh, like you've got, you've got everything going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would also say, obviously, your management, as in your approved provider. So if they are not sure of what's happening um, and don't understand it, it, it might cause a, quite a roadblock. Um, I know a lot of services have upper management, like area managers and regional managers. So that's a lot of people that you have to talk with to get approval. Um, and that's why I think we um, were so successful was because our approved providers were just like you, as long as you're trying to achieve um, you know, great occupancy and everybody's happy um, and there's not a huge staff turnover and if the families are okay with it, then we're okay with it. Um, so we were able to introduce things um, very easily. Um, but I know that a lot of people might come up against some significant roadblocks. Um, and that's when I just say, just do your research, um, back your evidence up with the regulations and things to be like, this is okay. Um, I follow a lot of early childhood services on Facebook. So I get ideas of what other services are doing and be like, okay, if they're doing that, then it must be okay. So how could we introduce something like that into our program? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and like you said, that's, what's important. Don't just go in with an idea with nothing to back you. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and it can be obviously anyone kind of, it could be your educator in a room um, it could be your room leader, your centre manager, your admin, your 2IC. I think you suggested the cook about yes. removing the barriers, right? So it's about it's about listening to everyone and supporting that idea with evidence, regulations. Um, and I suppose the other thing you would have met a lot of is the um, authorised officers. Yes. How receptive are they to things that might be a little bit out of the the norm, for example, or how do you how, how do you um, get them on side with that? Because obviously it's a rating thing, and to me, you know, like that's just fantastic to do these things. How how yeah how receptive are authorised officers? So I found um, for my service that any time anybody came out, everything was great, and um, we had our um, assessment of rating in twenty eighteen. That was the first one following all these changes, um, and we got exceeding in that 
um, round. Um, so we must have been doing something really good. Um, because <laughs> it was one of the first services in our local area to be rated exceeding at that time. Um, so they were generally very positive. Um, it was just um, as long as you had done risk assessments and you had um, evidence to show the consultations with families and the consultations with staff um, just to back up why these things um, were introduced. Um, but I've just found that with authorised officers, if you can explain why and you can back it up with the evidence, um, they, as long as it's not a breach of any form of regulation, yeah. <laughs> then they are very supportive of childcare services and kindergartens doing these um, additional programs that's like, you yeah. know, the bush kinders and the beach kinders, that's not a thing that was around in my first, when I first started in childcare, but now it's become such a norm because certain services were pushing it and now a lot of services offer it because it's become popular, I guess, um, yeah. from yeah. others and doing that research, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the re and that, that research of someone actually may support other services doing things. That's right. Yeah. Because, you know, we know everyone speaks on socials. We know everyone speaks at meetings and groups and whatever it is that you, that you communicate um, what you do on. So it is important to have that, that one person that might do something small actually can make an impact across so many services. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, with, um, and I'm just recapping what you said. So with, with, getting something through that might be seen not norm, have your research, have your evidence, importantly your communication with your families through yeah. surveys or whatever it is, risk assessments, communications with staff, and once again it takes us back to that original one of the the setting the the meeting, setting the sharing the the load, getting getting the buy in. That's right. Um, is that sort of sum that up? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Oh look um, and it's it's so important to get someone who's you know just had an impact in the sector. So um, it's it's been great. The other thing we love to ask our guests. Okay, I'm going to get your name wrong. Eliza. 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 Yeah. Eliza. So, <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> I will get it by the end. That's the, right. um, <laughs> We love to ask our guests, what are the big challenges facing the sector over the next few years from your perspective? Yeah, so um, definitely I believe that staffing shortages would be um, one of our biggest hurdles at the moment. Um, I have found in the last few weeks that I've had a lot more um, response to ads we've had up for educators in our organisation, um, a lot more than I was normally expecting. Um, but um, I then it starts to um, go into more the quality side because they have got their diplomas or their bachelors or graduate diplomas so quickly um, because we had such a shortage that they've brought in um, those, uh, I can't think of the word, concessions so that people who had a degree in an, in another field could now be an educa uh, educator if they did like another year or two of a graduate yeah. diploma. Yeah. Um, so I just feel that it, the quality might struggle for a little while until all of those newer educators find their feet, um, especially the ECTs because, um, you know, we look to them as leaders um, and if they haven't been in the early childhood sector for very long, um, then you know they're also at the very beginning of their journey and then a cert three or a recent diploma is looking at them for guidance um so i think it just might be a couple of rocky years until all of those new um ects find their feet and and learn all those skills that you learn when you first start in childcare. yeah and i think what we've talked about our topic today even though it's about occup occupancy the the, the inner layer of that is that new ECT comes in, but having the structure that you talked about, having those programs, the evidence, the meeting, the the forms, everything set up um, to support the centre as a whole, someone new coming in won't be so shocked or alarmed or is that sort of or in fear of what, what am I doing? Do you think that's, that's fair to say? Yes, definitely, yep. Yeah, no, that's fantastic because I think it's – and once again, it all links back to your families and your occup, 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 occupancy. Yes. <laughs> that's a word. Now, um, what we like to ask is 
what wise words or motivational quotes, something that drives you each day that you've got in your head that goes, this is what, what I live by or this is something that really inspires me. Have, have you got one that you'd like to share share for our listeners today? Yes, yeah, so um, I, I mentioned it in the discussion, but I'll say it again, that my whole um, time in early childhood has always been to say to people that not every service is for every family. Um, and as a manage- person in management, you know, we're supposed to be focused on occupancy pretty much as number one. Um, but I believe if you're going to have somebody in your service who doesn't believe in your philosophy um, and who might become disgruntled by some of the practices, um, then it overall will not be so great for the occupancy because you you know they could go and tell people don't go there they let them play outside in the rain because they don't agree with it um so if you build a community around everyone buying in um then as i said everyone will be happy the families will be happy they'll tell other families and if they're thinking that's not really for me then they'll try another childcare service but majority yes. of them will come to you and be like no i like this i can see how what a beautiful family it is, a family feel. Um, so that's what I just keep saying. Just buy into your philosophy and um, accept that sometimes some people aren't going to buy into your philosophy. And and, and that is that is in everything, isn't it? It's like, but importantly, accepting that as you, and, and having the, the occup- occupancy that we were talking about, if you've got good occupancy and you and you've got that regular level of high numbers the the people that don't come to you is okay but if you had that low level number of occupancy you'd probably start to think it was you yeah uh, so so in fact the, there's the good out of that the good of that high occupancy what we're talking about supporting that supporting your staff lets the people that don't want to be part of your philosophy be okay and you be okay to let them go too. Right. And also just to be aware of too much change too fast. Um, so, you know, if you can, we had have had families over time who were like, oh, I'm not really comfortable with you letting my six month old play with a five year old um, because they could go in any room and any outdoor space. Um, but you're just giving them that time to be like, today they were in there and they had a great interaction with this older child and, and giving the family that time to yeah approve what we've been doing um whereas <laughs> you were like we're going to do multi-age grouping and we're going to do playing in the rain and we're going to have a campfire and then we're going to do all these things um it would just be too overwhelming um for certain people um and some families would just be like i can't with this place it's just too much so just incrementally adding in new things or making those changes and just seeing how they go as you pivot um, and that's why it was a journey over a long time. So we started yeah. in 2010 and that exceeding rating came in 2018. So that was a long time before we got that validation that definitely what we're doing is really yeah. great. Um, and the occupancy would have been maybe four, four or five years in when it really skyrocketed. And, and what I heard just then is communication with your family yes. is key. Yeah, definitely. It's- Oh, look, Eli- 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 oh, okay. I'm going to get this, Eliza. <laughs> Eliza, yes. <laughs> Eliza. Eliza. I keep thinking Simpsons, right? You've yes. got that in my head. Okay, what's her name? <laughs> <laughs> Eliza. Eliza, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Eliza. I really appreciate you being here with us today and sharing your journey right through the sector over the last, did you say 20 years? Yes. <laughs> wow. Well, congratulations. And also for, for that set, that service you managed from that 2010, 2018, having that, that, that um, validation of that, um, that rating really, you know, helps, helps those out there who may be struggling or who may also be at the part where you are going, yeah, it's so good. We feel so good about that. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you for your time. We'll talk soon. Thanks so much. Take care. Thanks.